Hi, everybody. Anne Louise Gittleman here once again for another episode of the First Lady of Nutrition podcast. And what a pleasure today to welcome a fellow nutrition visionary who has stood on the front lines of health and healing and has been decades before the masses. And he is the one that has talked about fungus before anybody ever caught a glimpse of the fungus linked to almost every disease known to man. And when I prepared my introduction for Doug Kaufman, who is the host and well-beloved and respected nutritional guru of Know the Cause, I noted that one of his books is dedicated to the living and deceased patients erroneously diagnosed with a serious disease when all the while they're actually suffering from an undiagnosed fungal condition. So Doug, Talk to us about fungus. I need to know the fungus link to almost every disease known to man, to allergies, to respiratory issues, to mental health, women's health, and the pandemic that we're currently focusing on today. So welcome mm. and hello, my dear friend. Very good to talk to you again, Dr. Gittleman. Thank you for the invitation. And uh, we do go back a ways. I'll never forget one time in the Townsend letter for doctors communicating with doctors, I read an article decades ago that you had written that said, be careful of grains. That was way before it was fashionable. And most people think, well, that's a carbohydrate. We chew it up, mix it with saliva, and it becomes sugar in our belly. But I was studying back then in the 70s and 80s the fungal link to our grain supply. I was just reading an article online today that our corn supply is very negatively impacted by this fungus. Uh, so is our wheat supply, so is our peanut supply. You add to that alcohol, which is the mycotoxin of brewer's yeast, and antibiotics. Uh, penicillium is the mold. The byproduct it makes is called penicillin. And you're a sitting duck for a fungal infection, and it can, like per your introduction, it can cause symptoms from head to toe, including, I am relatively convinced, something called COVID. Now that is exceedingly, exceedingly in, in provocative because we're doing our taping during the, the pandemic height of COVID-19. So before we delve into that, which you know we will, I have a question to ask. Many of our very, very astute followers and health aficionados are aware of the fungal link to peanuts, certainly, to, to wheat to some extent, and even corn. But when we take a look at so many of these non-gluten alternatives people are turning to rice how fungally related are the mycotoxins to rice and rice products doug kaufman i have long believed that people going on a gluten-free diet are not doing it scientifically most of them for gluten problems etc celiac disease i believe when a doctor says look i've learned about this gluten-free diet my patients are following it it's good here's a one pager go home and eat these foods and you'll feel better and Dr. Gittleman, I'm totally convinced that most people do feel better when they go off of, you know, wheat and so forth uh, for a period of time. And then their symptoms begin coming back again with a vengeance. You see sugar, which feeds fungus, and corn, often impregnated with fungus, are gluten-free. So when you go into the store and you want to eat gluten-free, well, I'm going to stay away from barley, and I'm going to stay away from rye, and I'm going to stay away from wheat, even whole wheat. I'm gonna to go to sugar and corn. So for a period of time, because they have changed their diet for a few weeks, they're saying, boy, this gluten-free diet really works. A month later, they're saying, why did it let me down? And the answer to that is because it was never gluten. It was poisons that are in our food supply that most doctors are totally unaware of. And so what about rice? I'm, I'm told that rice is a high source of arsenic. Do you think rice is just as deleterious and can it be fungally linked as well? You know, it's a grain. We silo it. Before siloing came along, I don't think we had all of these mycotoxin. Myco means fungus, toxin is a poison. And maybe I should start there. Most people don't know this. Of the 75,000 species of fungi that we have classified in America, only about 300 are known to induce symptoms or diseases in man. Of those, each of the 300 makes several poisons, natural poisons. They off-gas, they're liquid solids, gases, etc. And they can make those inside our body. We call these mycotoxins, and they're fully capable of inducing Crohn's symptoms, cancer symptoms, arthritis symptoms, diabetes symptoms, and our doctors, the saddest part of this, you and I have talked for decades, 
our doctors just haven't a clue. They miss this in their medical training. So if one were to take away grains, including rice, oats, barley, would you consider quinoa and buckwheat in the same category, Doug Hoffman? No, I don't. Um, seeds seem to be less impregnable with this fungus. However, sunflower seeds, as you and I talked years ago, they're now saying, do you ever eat a bag of sunflower seeds in your car and you're chewing on them and all of a sudden just yuck, a yeah. horrible <laughs> comes up? Yes, <laughs> that indeed. is aspergillus. That's probably aspergillus mold you just chewed on. And without a good immune system, that could take you down. So nuts as well as seeds can also be impregnated with mycotoxins is what you're telling us. But not as often as when we silo rice, like you said, and wheat the way we do, and corn the way we do. It's in those big metal dome silos that a little rain leaks in, and then a little sweating takes place because it gets 108 degrees out in Iowa where those silos are sitting, and they begin uh, getting wet. And at that point, I'm telling you, these mycotoxins show their ugly faces. And we only test, of the thousands of mycotoxins that exist in America currently, we only test for one. It is called aflatoxin, but that one is one of six or seven that is known to cause or suspected of causing human cancers. Phenomenally interesting. So we're giving people a lot of the practical before we delve into the fungus link to a whole slew of diseases, including COVID-19. Mm -hmm. But my question to you is, if we do without the grains in our diet, then what do you suggest people eat for their complex carbohydrates? I've always suggested starchy vegetables from your squash to your sweet potatoes, your yams, maybe some peas, maybe some beans that are properly cooked. What say you, Doug Kaufman? So I allow, looking back at this, and you have to understand, I go back so far. I remember working with Dr. Everett Hughes at USC Medical School, and we had lunch one day. And he said, uh, so you're eating an avocado? And I said, yeah. And there were clinical nutritionists, dietitians, sitting there with us, very nice women who said, oh, boy, I just need to tell you, be very careful. Do you remember those days? Oh, my goodness. Do I remember those days? When I talked about the importance of healthy fats, I was almost burned at the stake. I remember that. We uh, were two of a kind. And the dietitian said, you know, maybe once a month eat those. But I was loving these things. And we didn't know what monounsaturated fats were. So as far as carbs, I led grapefruit, the seeds of which have very potent antifungal properties, as does the meat and the oil in the grapefruit. I allow green apples. I allow berries, cherries, tart fruits uh, like that. And then, of course, like you said, the vegetables and squashes are all allowed. I looked carefully at the legume family, peas, beans, etc., and discovered that, yeah, they, uh, uh, they are a great source of protein, but I was looking at, you know, almonds and nuts and eggs and so forth in my diet. So I put them on the Kaufman 2 diet, which is we graduate because of their carbohydrate content. We graduate to peas and beans a month after we start the Kaufman 1 diet. So I've taken all of that into consideration. And you know, the funny part, I've had people, I'm in my 22nd year on television, and it's just grown and grown. And I've had people who said, Doug, I was a client of yours 35 years ago at one of these hospitals, and I'm still on your Kaufman 1 diet. And I kind of <laughs> wipe my brow, you know, thank God. So I know that people can stay on it for decades and live well, and they look amazing. So... We're on to something exciting. We're on to something exciting. It's so interesting to see how your career has mirrored so much of what I've done in my own uh, career over the past, what is it, it's now four decades that, that we both shared the limelight in, in terms of nutrition. And in, in, yeah. your, in your Kaufman diet, phases one and two are very similar to fat flush. And we've seen the very same thing occur. When you eliminate certain foods from the program and then integrate them in once people's immune systems have come up to snuff and their digestion is improved, it's amazing what happens. Oh so, my God. So the first it, thing, I'm sorry. Well, I have so much to ask you. So when it comes to diet and, and, and healing, are there any particular herbs and um, I would say herbs and even essential oils that are particularly antifungal. And then talk about some of the pharmaceutical drugs that are actually doing their magic because they're antifungals, including statin. <laughs> and that's a, that's a good lead into what I wanted to talk about also. 
Uh, when Dr. Weekly, the physician who brought me here from LA in 1987 to Texas, I worked with him at one of the big hospitals out here, and he was out of Johns Hopkins, a very learned man. And he emoted a couple of times. He actually couldn't believe that psoriasis and granuloma annulari and all of these horrible oozing, bleeding skin problems, not all of them, but most of them had a fungal component. He actually emoted. How did we do this? I said, Dr. Weekly, if you and the other doctors will prescribe an antifungal, an AIDS medicine called Diflucan back then in the 80s, if you'll prescribe a bloodstream antifungal and a gut antifungal called Nystatin, I will put these people on my diet and we'll see in two weeks if their psoriasis, if their skin condition is due to uh, this fungus. And Dr. Gittleman, they would come back and I'm telling you, these people were emotional. They brought in their families. They said, why for 16 years has my skin been bleeding and now for the past two weeks, it's gone. And I said, because it was diagnosed as psoriasis and it probably wasn't. You see, psoriasis and annulari and all these skin conditions don't respond to a diet change or antifungals, but your condition did. We are misdiagnosing, in my humble opinion, many, many conditions as being mycotoxin-driven, fungus-driven maladies, but we're giving them names, usually after a doctor, like Crohn's or Alzheimer's, and it's just amazing what those doctors did not learn in medical school. Oh, they learned a lot about bacteria and virus and protozoa, but nothing about mycotoxins, and that's where I came into the field, you know, many years ago. So it's your belief, and then we'll talk about some of the remedies perhaps at the end because I'm so interested and have so many questions to ask you, Doug. You know, every time we get together, it's like this wonderful <laughs> fest, and I can't get the words out fast enough, and you've got all the answers. So what you have just said is that there is a fungus link to the most prevalent diseases of our time. Could you illuminate on some of them, including um, maybe arthritis, um, heart health, mental health, allergies, and then let's move into COVID-19. How do we give study animals cancer? It is, um, it is immoral to study new drugs and new therapies on people with cancer. So we have to give bunnies or monkeys cancer. Well, how do we do that? Most of the time they are given cancer with a mycotoxin called aflatoxin. It's made by the Aspergillus species, a couple of them. These mycotoxins, by the by, they're growing in many HVAC systems in our homes. Uh, they are in our, some of our foods, etc. But we inoculate these bunnies over a period of a year or two, and they all get cancer. Mm. By the way, you use a different mycotoxin. This one is called streptozotocin or baflomycin. These are antibiotics. Antibiotics are fungal mycotoxins. And guess what? The bunnies no longer get cancer if you inject them with baflomycin or streptozotocin. They all get diabetes. Huh. If you stood back, Dr. Huh. Gittleman, just looked at that. It's amazing how when we study animals, we give them fungus and they get these diseases. And yet you and I, the past 30, 40 years, have been the only two nutrition people who have seen the cause and effect relationship. Mycotic arthritis is all over the place. That's fungus. M-Y-C-O means fungus. Mycotic arthritis. And yet your doctor doesn't address its cause. He puts you on an anti-inflammatory to help ease the pain. I'm, I'm like you. We would have been dangerous together because I want to know why my wrist hurts so bad. I want to know what that lump on the side of my neck is. Yeah, you call it lymphoma, but why did it start? And that's where I come into this field. So you, from what I understand, you have written, how, tell me how many books. Is it 10, 12, 20 at this point? <laughs> we just, uh, it takes a lot. You know this because you've written most of the best sellers out there. Uh, it will take me a good nine months to a year to collaborate, get my notes. I've written a dozen books with great people, Dr. Beverly Hunt, Dr. David Hall, amazing, bright, bright people. And just last year, I completed the Fungus Link to Women's Health Problems. And you'd be amazed. Did you know that fungi are endocrine disruptors? 
they disrupt thyroid hormone. They disrupt ovarian. Uh, they induce ovarian symptoms. I mean, it, they, they cause everything from head to toe that might be due to an endocrine malfunction. And so the new book uh, has just, it's, as you know, flying off the shelves. And then I put together the Kaufman Diet Guide. And that those two together continue to sell. But here's the amazing part. 20 years ago, I wrote a book called The Fungus Link to Weight Loss. 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. Yesterday, 18 of them flew off the shelves. Basically, it says, what makes bread rise? Could that same yeast be <laughs> making you rise? All we got to do to make yeast ferment is give it some sugar, right? And our diets uh, allow plentiful uh, yeast and plentiful weight gain. Which is why I'm so concerned with people that are now sheltering at home because so many of them are, are comforting themselves with too much sugar and that's going to make them very yeasty with this fungus yeah. among us. But besides yeah. that, is there a fungal connection, would you say, to depression? So that's been pretty well documented. It's been documented quite a while ago. And let me just kind of boggle your, uh, your listeners' minds a little bit more. If I haven't already, I'm sorry. A few years ago, they began studying selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. And, they, and these are drugs that help people cope with depression. And they found a startling side effect, which was unknown previously. They even, as I recall, ended the study with maybe we have novel new antifungal drugs in these antidepressant drugs. Mm. So isn't that fascinating that SSRIs, oh, by the way, they help people with depression. Oh, they also kill fungus. So is your depression due to brain fungus? Though this fungus grows anywhere except the teeth in the human body. Or is it really depression due to something that happened to you in early childhood or something? So these are things we must now consider. Psychiatrists and psychologists must start thinking about. And what about heart disease, which is still so prevalent in the country today? Atherosclerosis. Um, uh, Dr. A.B. Costantini, who I met and befriended many, many years ago, is before I moved here to Texas. So this had to be back in the late 70s, early 80s. Uh, Dr. A.B. Costantini with the World Health Organization, he and two other physicians uh, wrote Atherosclerosis, 700 pages, Hope at Last all 700 pages documenting the fungus link to hypercholesteremia. Did you know that statin drugs kill fungus just like antidepressant drugs? No, no, you once said that on one of your wonderful shows, Know the Cause, and I was just blown out of my seat at that <laughs> point. That is extraordinarily important. Could you repeat that and just explain a little bit? That's very fascinating. There are two drugs that were vying for popularity back in the 1980s. And Dr. Holland gave me this article, and both of us stood there like little boys, you know, in elementary school laughing. One drug was called Lamisil, and the other drug was called Sporinox. And they wanted to see which one killed toenail fungus the best. And the last sentence or two in the paper, you know, we both sat there reading the paper, and the last sentence said, one striking result was uh, that, I think it was Sporinox, it's called itraconazole. Itraconazole happened to lower people's cholesterol significantly. Huh. And all of the sudden, we had a gluttonous supply of antifungal drugs on the market. Oh, they were no longer called antifungal drugs, although they are. Lipitor kills fungus. All of the sudden, we had a whole new market. Nobody could have a fungal problem, but you know those 201 cholesterols are just killing people left and right. Mm -hmm. So we have convinced doctors, cardiologists, internal medicine, bright guys, we have convinced them that the problem is not our diet, is not our lack of exercise, uh, but rather it's their high triglycerides and high cholesterol. And how did we take them down? We renamed antifungal drugs to something more prominent, statins to stop. And that's how statin drugs got on the market. Interesting. Now, if we move into the concept of the connection between respiratory illness and fungi, move into COVID-19, because my understanding is that there's a kind of secondary pneumonia which takes place, and that's when things get very, very severe and very catastrophic. So is there a connection then? Here's the big $64,000 question. Is there a connection between the current pandemic, which may in fact last 
inevitably much longer, and fungi. You had to go back to the start of this when the U.S. funded a Wuhan laboratory. It was a virology laboratory in 2011 with a $3.7 million grant. These are all facts. It's all documented. For some reason, Dr. Gittleman, these uh, scientists went about 100 miles away from you know, Wuhan and went into bat caves and began taking fecal samples from the bats and then bringing those back into their virology laboratory. This represents a horrible, horrible error. Bat poop, bat guano, is histoplasma capsulatum. Oh. It is a fungus that if inhaled, it is striking. Let me just share something with you. Oh my Here are the commonalities. You get sick from COVID and this histoplasma by inhaling it. People with compromised immunity are more vulnerable to COVID and histoplasmosis. Their incubation period, two days to 17 days, is identical. Both can cause what you just said, adult respiratory distress syndrome or ARDS. Both can cause skin symptoms. Both share these symptoms, fever, chills, headaches, muscle aches, dry cough, chest discomfort, fatigue, sometimes ARDS and sometimes skin symptoms. Here's the take home message. Our doctors, I don't think understand genetic fusion. Genetic fusion is when the DNA or RNA, we call these nucleic acids, merge from one independent organism to another one. When those scientists went into those bat caves and disrupted the soil they were walking on, they put those histoplasma spores way up in the air. I'm sure they were garbed, but it fell on their headgear, it fell on their shoulders, it's in their shoes. Then they got in their cars and drove back 100 miles to the Wuhan virology lab where they were looking at viruses, COVID, SARS, etc. And guess what happened? They brought back poop samples from bats 10 years ago, and they've opened those. And the histoplasma capsulatum, an airborne fungi, fell onto all the COVID samples. They genetically cleaved the RNA from the virus and the DNA from the fungus genetically cleaved. Now you have a horrible problem because virologists study viruses but know nothing about histoplasma, and mycologists study histoplasma but know so nothing, nothing about, about virus. virus. So Isn't this fascinating? It's fascinating. And so where did, where did you get this very provocative information? And what were they doing? What were the virologists doing in the bat caves to begin with would be my question. What were they Thank doing you, with and you and I have the same What were they doing with bat poop? <laughs> <laughs> I first studied uh, guano, bat guano, about 12 years ago when the white nose syndrome, remember that? All these bats were dying of fungus growing through their bodies. Yes, you, yes, yes. It can even kill them inside their little bat cave. And so millions of bats died, and, I, and they called it the white nose syndrome. Well, I named it accurately about 12 or 13 years ago. But the south end of the bat, bats and birds poop their guano is histoplasma capsulatum. I believe God put a coating in the intestines that would break down their poop. Otherwise, our cars, our sidewalks, our homes, our people would be covered with the billions of birds there are in the world with bird poop. All of a sudden, this histoplasma breaks it down, but don't inhale this stuff. It's just like COVID. Don't inhale it. Bats and birds have histoplasma to break their poop down and the wind blows it away a day or two later and the rain cleans it all up. But when we breathe this, there are stories about the monks who used to, you know, those big uh, ceramic roofs on the churches and monasteries and so forth. When they'd go out and sweep that up, many of them contracted a disease we call histoplasmosis. And histoplasmosis is a respiratory disease caused by inhalation that killed huge numbers of them. And so what does one do for this particular malady? Let's say one is exposed. What would you do, Doug Hoffman? <laughs> I was so happy. One day I'm watching TV, and there sits a guy with really 
you know, less education about this than I have. His name is Donald Trump. And he's saying, yeah, there's this new, uh, you know, $14 prescription called hydroxychloroquine. And it really seems to be doing the job. And you could almost see the doctors around him win. <gasps> we don't want a $14 prescription on the market. Hydrochloroquine happens to be fungistatic. It stops fungus. It comes from... Oh, syn- oh so it's not just an anti-malarial, which could be connected you got to it. fungus as well. I see. I didn't it's derived that. in Chona bark. And you know what? When I landed in Vietnam, you know, 50 years ago now, they handed me a little crude bottle in Da Nang that I was to give. I was a Navy corpsman. I was to give all the Marines this stuff out in the field. Every week you have to eat one of these. None of them did it. It's cinchona bark. It's quinine. It's the base of hydroxychloroquine. And none of them did it because it would cause them to get sick and have diarrhea. And you think toilet paper is a problem here. There it was a huge problem. And so nobody wanted to take it. But it's the same stuff. Man just couldn't stand that we could scrape this off the cinchona tree in Peru and give it away free to people. So it became a synthetic drug. And that, and now what are you seeing? Vitamin C, antifungal. Zinc, antifungal. These things seem to be working for what we're calling a virus. Wait a minute, they don't have antiviral properties. Interesting. Interesting. So this is this is a big missing link, isn't it? Nobody's connecting the dots, are they? Just I'm not? I'm the only one doing it. I spoke the other day on a. We had seventeen thousand people join me the other day on a uh, on a social media live event because these people are scared. You know, cancer will kill huge numbers of people, but it takes a while. This can knock a person down and out in a short period of time, and viruses don't do that. Fungus and virus merging, huge problem. Symptoms doctors have never seen, but look at the fungal symptoms that histoplasma causes, and then merge that with the viral symptoms COVID causes, and I think we've got a science that's credible. So besides the hydroxychloroquine, which is which is a which may have side effects, would and I'm sure mm-hmm. you're aware of that. So then, yes. what natural remedies would be? Uh, in line for this type of affliction? I end my television shows with stay actively antifungal. And it's really interesting to note the hundreds of emails I get that, Doug, I'm, I don't know what to do with this anti or with this virus. What should I do? And I said, stay calm and remain actively antifungal. So you mentioned earlier about all the herbs, about all the vitamins, about all the supplements that Unikey and many great companies have. That's how we stay actively antiviral. You see fungi, most of these mycotoxins that's in our beer, in our wine, in our bread, most of these mycotoxins are immunosuppressive. So if you're a regular drinker, you're on lots of antibiotics, or you eat a lot of bread and pasta and things of that sort, God forbid you have compromised immunity or you're obese or you have diabetes, you know the litany of things. Um, Your immune system begins sliding in the presence of all these molds in your HVAC, ducting system, et cetera. Any virus can pick you up with a snap of its little finger. So be actively antifungal, and I think that will enhance your immune system. And again, I have no, I have nothing to sell. I have no dog in the fight. I'm just trying to help people understand if you can keep your immune system up, you become actively antibacterial and actively antiviral. So many of my clients have been exposed to mold. Would the program for antifungal remedies be the same for those of us that have contracted some type of mold? Mm-hmm. It, as a matter of fact, it is. And, and think again now what, what we're saying. Fun, in a, here's what Dr. Elizabeth Moore Landacker, oh, what an incredible woman. She's written many textbooks on, in mycology. She's a PhD mycologist. She says that in a human cell, fungal cell relationship, guess which one becomes the dominant cell? The fungus. Before long, Dr. Gittleman, your clients that you see are hiding Hershey bars in their sock drawer. Mm -hmm. 
can't they can't get enough sugar and remember a potato is a third a cup of sugar they can't get enough potatoes and starches and rice and and things of that sort because they're no longer feeding their human cells many of them find their cells out of control what in the world is my middle thing in my car loaded with Hershey's kisses right I've got to get the sugar in my body you have a dominant fungal cell that has taken over and as evil as that sounds I believe her word is right now before you know it she also said fungi alter the pH of mediums they grow in that was her words verbatim mm. so all of a sudden you have a whole society that is looking at you know uh, alkaline water and products to help you get alkaline when all the while the al the acidity in the belly is inducing the need for alkaline water or greens versus grains you know greens being alkaline grains being acid so I've been around you know if I if I seem tall it's because I stood on the shoulders of the most incredible scientists who understood mold even though they weren't taught it in their medical training what I find so disappointing with people that need scientific basis and evidence-based nutrition is that when you do typical mold testing, they don't find the exact species that you may be carrying or sequestering. Is there a particular laboratory that is out there now that is more accurate than most? So I've got to tell you, I have been, I know most of them, obviously. Uh, that's not true. I know some of them the tests will never be accurate. What are we finding with COVID? Whoops, 80% false positive, because it isn't a virus. I think most of us suffer from what we call concomitant infections. I think most people who have a fungal condition and therefore immunosuppressed, succumb to parasites. I mean, you're my go-to person, always <laughs> have been. And I didn't know how much you knew until the past few years in reading your work. Parasites are a given with people with mycosis, fungal conditions. Most people reporting to a doctor, oh, God bless his heart, what he understands is bacteria and virus. He could never imagine a world where genetic fusion took place between a virus and a mold. He could never imagine that if you didn't have rectal itching from a worm trying to get out, that anybody would have a parasitic infection. So while you thank me this past hour, we all need to thank you for your pioneering work in parasitology. We all have concomitant infections. That's why the labs aren't real accurate. We all represent a thumbprint. Very, very true, and thank you for your lovely acknowledgement. I know that one of the basic parasites that we're now looking at, which seems to be so prevalent in laboratory testing, is blastocystis. And that was first recognized as a fungus, and now it has morphed into a parasite or a protozoa. So what you're saying is exactly correct. And I think that people may be looking in the wrong places. Would you like to share with us your particular antifungal uh, protocol? And I'll share mine, Doug Kaufman. Sure, sure. And I have to tell you, this is what brought my family. I, I picked up my, I was probably 37, 38 years old. My wife was young, two little boys, five and, and two years old. And we left Texas. And I remember keeping our home there at the beach in California. We left LA, headed for Texas, and we rented our home. Because I had been going into this very prominent doctor's office, well politically connected. And he was seeing miracles happen when his patients went on antifungals. So who, who was this, pray tell? That was David Weekly, Dr. Oh. David Weekly, huh. uh, a very prominent dermatologist out of Johns Hopkins who brought me into his practice in 1986. And by 1987, signed a deal with me, a five-year deal to work in his practice. Here's what I discovered, Dr. Gittleman. Doctors don't have many patients that get better. They have many patients whose symptoms are on hold as long as they take this pill every four hours or six hours. Well, you lose a lot of patients, and Dr. Weekly was smart enough to understand that. So he started bringing me in four days a month to Dallas, and I worked at this great hospital, 
and he was blown away four months later at what he was seeing. So my antifungal protocol with Dr. Weekly and the doctors he worked with, and then a doctor upstairs at the hospital, as doctors began meeting me, I worked with a doctor who was the attending emergency room doctor when John Kennedy was shot. Um, his name is Lou Kriegel, amazing doctor. I worked with a lot of these pioneer doctors mm. here in Dallas. My protocol at that time was, look, doctor, I, I don't know what's causing her headaches. I don't know why she's amenorrhea because she's not having a menstrual period. I don't know why she's depressed. I don't know why the back hurts so bad and yet you can find nothing on x-ray. But let's try this. Would you allow me, there's a, there's a pill being used for AIDS, and by the way, AIDS patients just happen to die of fungal diseases. There's a pill that's been FDA approved called Diflucan for AIDS patients. It kills fungus in bloodstream. Would you let me try Diflucan on your patient? Would you let me talk to them about trying my diet only for two weeks? Look at all these recipes I have. And so my program became psyllium. To, psyllium absorbs, it's a non-digestible fiber. What that means is what goes in must come out. It enhances peristaltic activity, makes the bowels wanna work. So it, and it binds mycotoxins in the gut. So I put everybody on psyllium. I put everybody on a very crude back then, you know, 33 years ago, probiotic. Um, I put everyone the doctors would let me on Diflucan and I used my diet. And then we mandated that they come back and meet with the doctors and the nurses and me in two weeks. The results, I can't even, I still can't talk about it. They were staggering. Dr. Weekly asked Linda, his nurse, to put Kleenex boxes in every exam room because these people started emoting. Why have I gone through this disease? And here's what we discovered. Oh my goodness. He was a dermatologist. He didn't treat blood sugar. He was a dermatologist. He didn't treat cancer or hiccups or joint pain. But these people would start saying to us, you know, look at my skin. Oh my gosh. But can I ask you a question? I don't wake up and urinate three times at night anymore, these guys would say. Um, it's, that's because prostatitis is a fungal condition. 80% of the time, so says the, the uh, Central European Urology Journal. So we began fixing things. We had no idea what we were seeing. David dies. Four years into our five-year agreement, he contracted cancer and he died. And that left me, and you probably don't know this story, but I, in uh, Fort Worth, Texas, I drive out a couple nights a week and I began taking courses in uh, uh, studying herbs. And I thought, surely God put herbs here that had antifungal properties. Well, when the student is ready, the teacher appeared, every herb. I'm telling you, it's no wonder people who take herbs feel so good. So I learned all this in years and I realized I may not need a doctor. So some of these doctors assisted me in opening a little practice out in Dallas and they would refer their patients to me and I would use herbs and psyllium and probiotics and uh, fatty acids. You know, people don't know that caprylic acid is one of the best antifungals on the market. And what's it cost? 20 bucks at a health food store. It's a coconut oil derived fatty acid. When you hear fatty acid, fish oils, et cetera, they're antifungal. So I began putting people on these and my diet, mandatorily my diet. And what I learned was mind boggling. It was a very exciting time in my life and it still is. Now with the TV show and hundreds of thousands of people viewing that and with the success of social media, what I'm doing is teaching. I'm training people that you can, what you've been training people 40 years, you can have a do-over if you're willing to hear me and heed me. Hear and heed and refashion and reintegrate and reconstruct and renew. So on a daily basis, you know, I have been integrating much of your fungal philosophy, Doug. And I, mm -hmm. and I remember first being a, a guest on your show years ago, and I thought to myself, this is interesting. Maybe this fad will come and go. Just for the way the yeast connection did in the 80s, you remember Billy Crook's work. Yes, yes. 
and I have seen everything that you have said, everything that you have preached come true in this day and age. So I know you've been on the cutting edge. And that's why so much of what I learned from you on those early shows has kind of stayed with me. I used to think it was parasites that are the most immunosuppressive agents known to man. I now think it's a combination of the parasitic infestation, fungus, mold, and yeast. And you've got to really be very diligent in getting rid of and, and eliminating and neutralizing to the best of your ability. And when you cheat, you, you should have certain fix go to fix it so to speak that are that are natural which is why when i do when i get up in the morning i take an, a natural it's a uh, homeopathic called yc cleanse it of course is put out by uh unikey health systems for which i'm a brand ambassador but i also do something that i learned from you which is do a nasal saline rinse using a little bit of salt and baking soda and i'm putting in a little bit of chelated silver to get into the sinuses as much as possible the ear canals and i'm now starting to gargle a little bit with chelated silver and then i'm taking something for the biofilm and i'm hoping you'll touch upon that in our last five minutes the biofilm which is the the kind of mucousy, gunky, uh, phlegmy layer that can protect the bacteria and fungus so that you, if, you, if you get rid of the fungus, you still have that biofilm. So I'm taking a new product called Biofilm Defense. It's made a huge difference in my own system because I contracted mold many years ago. So can you talk about the biofilm connection as we start to wind up, wind up this wonderful conversation? Sure, happy to. Um, biofilm, okay. Here's the best way I can describe it to audiences. I was in Vietnam in 1970 and 71. We didn't brush our teeth. We were lucky to have teeth, you know, during that whole year. Mm. You know that stuff, Dr. Gittleman, that grows on your teeth, right? When you don't, biofilm, it's a biofilm. Now, unfortunately, when doctors hear biofilm, they see bacteria. When I hear biofilm, I think fungus. Fungus is certainly capable of forming a network over themselves, a blanket, if you will. And yes, there are bacterial biofilms also. But how do you get rid of biofilms? When our diet is fast food, you're not getting any enzymes. The reason God put, one of the reasons, enzymes in real spinach, in real food, was to assure that biofilms never formed. It's kind of brushing our teeth every morning. So people who eat a diet rich in whole organic foods or juice with ginger and, you know, all these guys, a handful of, of uh, Italian parsley and organic carrots and green apples, you're getting lots of enzymes in those things. We need to address these biofilms because they hide. I'll give you an analogy. An ascomycete is a sac that fungus grows in, and it can mimic a cancer sac. Fungi cover themselves hoping that our white blood cells don't gobble them up. And one way they have of doing that is with a clear blanket, often grows in our sinuses, called a biofilm. I think, did you ever have these little uh, notepad, these little stickums, you know? I think two or three of those little stickums begin forming atherosclerosis. 20, 30, 40, 50, 100 of them, because we still drink our beer and we love our alcohol. Oh, and by the way, we get sick when we do that, so the doctor puts us on lots of antibiotics. Yeast, 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 yeast. And I think that those post-its are 50 to 100 layers deep, inducing a condition called clotting or atherosclerosis, plaque, either amyloid plaque in, in uh, Alzheimer's or regular plaque, arterial plaque in uh, heart disease. Yes, I think there's a fungus component to even these biofilms that grow on or in us. So when I discovered my biofilm destroyer, which is called uh, Biofilm Defense, it made the hugest difference because I've been trying to kill the fungus, kill the yeast, kill the underlying cause for years, but not getting at that biofilm was really my undoing. So I'm so grateful for you for educating the public and me as one of your guests on Know the Cause to this very important issue that nobody seems to be talking about. So if we're gonna kill the fungus in conclusion, do you like olive leaf extract? 
Uh, so I'll have leaf extract. I spoke earlier of something called caprylic acid. Caprylic acid tends to be more antifungal. I like a universal antimicrobial. Olive leaf extract is is such a killer. It really doesn't matter if it's a virus or, you know, if it's a bacteria. Olive leaf extract is one of my go-tos because if I'm not sure, wow, I got some sniffles, starting to run a little fever, I'm going to throw down some olive leaf extract. And it really does seem to work very, very well. It, and you mentioned, you know, uh, silver and some other things have generalized antimicrobial activities as opposed to lauric acid, caprylic acid, other things that are more specific to fungus. What about podargo and the wonderful ondequinoic acid derivative from castor oil, which is the SF722? Love. Uh, both of those love neem. Undesalinic acid is unreal. Podargo is from a tree. Once again, Going to go back where we started today. Cinchona bark makes uh, hydroxychloroquine. Uh, you know, this tree that grows in the Brazilian rainforest from which we use the bark uh, is powerfully antimicrobial. I think our, do you look at medicine cabinets different from when you and I were kids? <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think, uh, I don't have any medicines in there, but man, I got tooth powders, I got all sorts of deodorant that is live and well, and I mean, it, it's so different from what mom and dad had. They're very true, and I must tell you that when I went to college, I went to Connecticut College, and probably around the same time that you went to school, I felt absolutely left out that I didn't have the medicine chest that every other student had. <laughs> <laughs> and little did I know that I was actually being protected and very blessed. So last but not least, this is what I need to ask you. What are you up to, Doug Kaufman? I know you have a worldwide best-selling book, several best-selling books to be exact, about the fungus link. I know that you have a very well-received television show called Know the Cause. What's up for you in the next horizon? You know, people ask me, my own accountant, we were in there the other day, and he said, uh, you know, Doug, I'm kind of winding it down. I've been with you for 35 years. I'm kind of winding down my practice. When are you going to do that? I guess when I'm no longer happy getting the testimonials that I get. I, can't, I am so humbled that people, Elsa called me the other day, her lymphoma. I sent her to a doctor in San Diego, a friend of mine. Her lymphoma wasn't really lymphoma, although her doctors told her chemotherapy is your only way out. It's gone. And the doctor I sent her to contacted me and he said, Doug, her oncologist was blown away. Why would I quit something like that? I want to continue doing this. I want to continue growing the audience. I have very loyal sponsors who have stayed with me through this For years point. and years and yeah, years. 20 years. Uh, so I love what I do. I'm going to keep doing this, and uh, we'll see on down the road. But uh, I have no want to kayak, you know, on the Colorado River. It, it, I love what I do. I, I go to bed at night excited. I wake up Monday morning excited. I'm like you. You know, we're not going to just drop out of this. Or play bridge. <laughs> God bless the bridge players. So I want to thank yeah. you so much. Will you come back again and share your wonderful knowledge and your wonderful sense of humor and passion and integrity? If you do that on my television show, you got a deal. We got a deal. I want to thank you so much. And everybody, Doug's books, the best-selling books are The Fungus Link. And tell us the name of your latest book. It's the woman's uh, guide, the, the, the woman's gu anti-fungal guide, the woman's guide to fungal diseases. There you have it. And catch, we'll catch you on Know the Cause, which is now, and how many homes in the, in the world right now, Doug? Oh, I, I, who knows? I, I, I can't even count anymore. But in the U.S., we're on uh, WGN America. Just go to WGN America, put your zip code there, and even in the smallest towns in America, like the one you live in, it'll pop up five different stations where you can, every zip code in America carries Know the Cause. Lovely. Would you give my love to Ruth, please, your beautiful wife? And mine to James. Okay. Lots of love. We'll talk to you soon. Lots of love. Be well. Be healthy. Anne Louise Gittleman signing off for this episode of First Lady of Nutrition Podcast. See you again, my darlings.